Now here's a question that's been pretty much on my mind in recent days. I'll tell you why in a second you get the impression. The question is this. How do you sustain a church's mission, the church's mission, okay, the church universal, how do we sustain the church's mission in this part of the world, the ongoing work of God, the kingdom of God, in the midst of a massive recession? Because economically, things are pretty grim. Have you noticed? <laughs> I won't tell you anything you don't know yet. Things are pretty rough out there, aren't they? You've got jobs, or you're in business, or you're out of work, or whatever it happens to be, and you know there's a recession going on. How, how do you keep God's work going in, in, the, in the midst of all of that? I've, I've heard recently two missionary families whose <coughs> um, support from one source has been cut by 80%. How do you keep on? Of course, there are plenty others. Huh? Yeah, plenty others. Who, who? It's all gone. How do you sustain the ongoing work of the kingdom of God in the midst of a recession? Well, we're all feeling a squeeze. Not that much of a squeeze, surely. Eighty percent. So, uh, of course, we need to be saying to some extent to, to the Lord's people, well, let's get our priorities right. Because obviously there are people in the church who, because of the recession, are much, much better off than they were before. With interest rates as they are, and mortgages as they are, you know, there are other people who are much better off. If you're in work, you can be much better off. Um, the danger is at times like these, we, we, all of us feel a bit threatened and shaken, so we pull up the drawbridge and shut up the shop. And uh, we say, whoa, conservatism comes to rule. I understand that. How do you handle a recession and still keep God's work going forward? You see, we've come perhaps to the view, there's a very predominant view out there, that the way to push the kingdom of God forward, plant churches and so on, is to work out a budget for premises, for a load of uh, fancy equipment to be able to put on the best audio-visual musical show in town, uh, employ a cast of thousands, uh, and uh, publicise a big multimedia launch. Uh, following on Google Plus, a bunch of young fellas in America at the moment who are doing just this. And there was this tremendous announcement I think last week and the week before. We've reached our budget and now we can start. <laughs> so, what Jesus did in his last words to his disciples, his followers, and us, he said, Guys, get your hands together, we're going to sort out a budget. Lots of money gets spent out that way. In the American church growth, people I read some of are beginning to suggest that the biggest numbers of lives are not changed in this way. Interesting. Well, to be honest, we knew that already. The Lord's church planting strategy is a little bit different, and it springs up in an age of real fiscal pressure. Did you realise that? When Jesus was born in Palestine, and when he was walking around in Galilee, preaching and teaching and making disciples and calling people away from their struggling businesses, he was doing that at a time of enormous economic depression. What had happened was that the Romans had marched in, and on top of the taxes they already had, the Romans brought their own. So little businesses like Peter, James and John, fishing by the Sea of Galilee, they were being absolutely hammered by a whole new layer of bureaucracy and taxes run by people like Matthew, also known as Levi, the tax collector who also became a follower of Jesus with them. Interesting that bit, isn't it? Wrestling with taxation and recession. And these small businessmen were struggling with the imposition of a whole set of burdens in their economy and on their business. So what's the strategy, Lord Jesus, for church planting in times of stagflation and zero economic growth? Here's how it goes. One. All, all strategies have numbers in them, don't they? You know this one. Defeat sin and death and hell by sacrificially atoning for sin and rising from the dead. That's a very good start. How about that? Two, give clear evidence to both followers and doubters that sin's price has been paid and the gates are life flung wide. Yes. But then it gets really exciting. In fact, then it gets a little bit scary. Watch this. Three, get those who believe all this to go out and tell the tale to anyone and everyone who hear it. 
entrust all that to them. And then get those who believe as a result of what they do and say, get them baptised and discipled too, to be followers of Christ. And then, God's plan is to stay close to everyone who's engaged in that enterprise. You see, you're working with very unpromising material, aren't you? You've committed this enormous treasure to the most unpromising of material, but when they get stuck into that job, you stay close to them. You stay on their show. Lo, I'm with you always to the very end of the age. Sorry that came out in authorised version then. Did you notice? Can't help it. It happens sometimes. Let's call it a relapse. Now that's really all there's ever been to it. And I confess I find myself longing for all sorts of props to help me with that. They can help with that. There's always this thing in the back of the head of every church planter in the world. I was reading somebody's blog this week saying, you know, I could do an awful lot more with a salary. I'm sure we could. I'm sure we all could, shouldn't we? That'd be great. Get on with it. You could do an awful lot more to win people to Jesus if you, if, if you had time committed help and coaching with your witness. I mean, the full time pastor would know, help you. We could do an awful lot more with a building, couldn't we? I saw surveyors out this week. Looking at that field where they're putting the road through, when they put the road through, they'll put up flood defences. We hope when they put up flood defences, we hope maybe we'll have somewhere. I don't know. What do we do? Should we wait? Or should we get on? Joe, you know, this is a real. We'd be much better at attracting and holding people here if we had a band and a floor show and a fancy programme with bits that appeal to everybody, you know, different sectors in society. Wouldn't that be great? You're looking at me now as if I come from another planet, because this ain't anywhere near our experience, is it? This isn't what we've got. But Jesus' pattern of outreach, his plan for the future of the kingdom of God at a time of horrible pressure on the economy of his day, involved none of that. It involved this. Then Jesus came to them, then, at that time, Jesus came to them and said... All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I'm with you always. To the very end 